and we are live and yes we're going to get into trouble today so apologies to everyone who gets their feelings hurt during today's show but it's all for a good cause <laughs> anyhow uh, i'm joined by returning champions josh greenbaum and bonnie tinder or bonnie duncan tinder i guess raven intel bonnie welcome josh welcome thanks john glad to be here yeah always fun john and and it's good to be here at bonnie i just want to say that's a Absolutely. welcome addition thank you <laughs> absolutely yeah and uh this is going to be good uh, the, this this notion of customer success and how we're falling short or how we can live up to the potential of phrase has become an important debate uh and you know i when i when i wrote this blog post this i've been kind of cooking up for a while on this topic it kind of set off a spark josh issued not really a rebuttal right. though i think it was an no, it, it, I don't think so. more of a companion piece than anything yeah. um and and then and now we want to fill in the gap on both of our posts with some of Bonnie's thinking on this topic, um, and and basically the kind the way I think about customer success is that I think it's a it's what I call a the it has a buzzword boomerang effect. It, as soon as you start using the term, it's funny how then you're kind of holding up a mirror, a customer success mirror to yourself, and so <laughs> after hearing from. I don't know, the hundredth vendor this year about how great their customer success programs were and how successful all their customers were. I kind of blew a gasket. And so I wrote a post about that. Uh, attention vendors, please stop the customer success hype train unless you have these six proof points. Wrote that on Diginomica. And uh, the, the thing I did on that post is I picked six proof points that I think would be very hard to disagree with including things like your great NPS score isn't enough. Why? Because it's a lagging indicator, way too static. Anyway, I went through a bunch of them. Where's your customer bill of rights? Um, have your SI partners embraced your KPIs? Are you working at cross purposes? These are really difficult. And one of the ones I said are where, where's your auditing and licensing, licensing dashboards? Because how can you have customer success uh, if, if you're, if you're going to have a surprise audit with one of your customers, which by the way, still happens a lot. We might get back to that topic. <laughs> Right. So, uh, so, so the reason I, the reason I, the reason I did all that, uh, was, was, was because I, I really think it's time to, to, to challenge ourselves on what, what the potential for this really is. Um, but I intentionally, uh, limited my focus largely to, to, to the vendor community. And, and so Josh was cooking up some stuff on the customer side anyway, I think, because, Josh, your post, it didn't come off like kind of a reactive rant. It came off like something you've been on the slow burn for a while there because it was a really inspired oh, yeah. post. But instead of attention vendors, you did attention customers. So tell us about that. Well, you know, it, it, it has been a slow burn for, for a long time. And, you know, my one of my one of my aphorisms, you know, is that it takes three to really screw up a project vendor, a partner, and a customer. And so I figured, let's let's really do the thing that no one likes to do, which is point a finger at customers. You know, everyone's trying to sort of stick around the problem, treat them with kid gloves, because of course they're the, you know, they're the they're the ultimate uh, <clears throat> source of the gravy train that we all feed on. Um, but I think, you know, I think that that really a little tough love was 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 warranted. It always has been. And you, you know, I I've been I had been formulating this and sort of keeping lists and kind of, you know, and then I saw that and think, this is perfect. You know, yin yang, let's go for, let's talk to them. And, and, you know, again, it's tough love. It's, it's done. It's done from that perspective of, um, you, you know, we want, we, we, the industry want everybody to take responsibility. And in this case, you know, the customer, and I think, you know, and, and one of the things that's bothered me for a long time is that, you know, customers end up being part, you know, complacent to a large degree it's 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 almost built into the model that um that we you know that that we expect these projects not to go well we expect the value to be you know so so um and we gotta stop that and i think you know customers because they hold the purse strings have the ability to really do something about it and they should you threw down the phrase culture of mediocrity josh so you weren't messing around um, you, you included a number of, of cool aphorisms or proof points in your post. Do you want to just grab a couple right now that like really jump out at you today as far as what customers need to take ownership from? 
you know, I mean, that's, you know, the flip side of the, it takes three parties to really screw up a project is, of course, success means the active participation of all three parties, vendor, service provider, and customer. So, you know, and I, and so, you know, my challenge, my 11, because six wasn't enough, I had to go for 11 <clears throat> proof points uh, for customers was, you know, really the basic of you're actually in charge. Uh, don't forget, you know, work with the customers who really do the kind of things that, that John, you know, you say in your, your post, which is, which, which is what the catalyst was so perfect for us. Like I've been thinking about this Oh, Hey, you know, my point is already taken up by, by an excellent post by John. So I'll go for that. Um, and the, the issues about transparency, about making contracting better about the whole kind of concept of let's, let's do a better job. Just, you know, ask your vendor to do a better job being that partner that they've always said they are. Um, you know, and I think I think you and I have talked about this in Bonnie as well. You know, I I'm a I'm a sole proprietor. I've been that way for 30 years. Um, if I if I treated my customers the way certain vendors treat their customers, I would have been out of business long ago. Um, it's not maybe the perfect model, but this is what we need to do. I think I think you know there and that and then you start looking at well, okay, now that now that I've got some of these basics, what about service and support? What do I get from service from my vendor? What do I get from my vendor's partner? This their ecosystem I'm in. I, I want them to have a. I want to sort of pressure them to have a role in customer success as well. And then, you know, Bonnie's going to be the the expert on the partner ecosystem in a second. Um, obviously, you know, and and again tip of the hat to, to Raven and my own still still alive dog in this fight pro Q. you know you, you need objective third-party data to do this and um and you want partners that you know customers that really stick to this stuff and not, don't don't pretend don't make it you know this this virtue signaling we're you know we're there for you kind of stuff while they're you know really really there for the the investor. I think that's really the thing. You know, who's who's really who, who's the vendor really working for? If they're not working for the customer, then they're working for the the investors and, and their own stock price and their own you know their own pocketbook, and that's that's wrong. Um, and then the last the last two in my eleven, which I've sort of abbreviated, don't cut corners around training. Oh my God, that's like absolutely. You know, I can bang my head against the wall at, at the number of times I've seen these contracts just flake out because oh well we had budget for training but we ran over budget so we'll just skip the training and then finally getting you know get help and this was of course a little self-serving but lord knows i couldn't possibly um begin to satisfy all the demand for having a third party objective third party sitting in the room helping you as a customer balance all these incoming problems um so that was sort of my quick quick overview um um, and uh, yeah, I got a lot of pushback, good pushback for the most part. No, I, I, no one, I, I can start in the engine of the car every morning. No one's trying to blow me up yet, so I must be okay. Yeah, I, and I, I think your post is essential reading. I put in a link to mine, which also contains a link to Josh's. I'll post Josh's link a little bit later. I don't want to bombard the chat too much with with a bunch of links at once. But uh, those of you in the chat who have views on what it takes to actually achieve meaningful customer success, not not BS hype or welcome to chime in. Um, this topic's not going away. And, you know, I think I, I was really glad for what Josh did because, look, I mean, I, I, I really hung vendors out to dry a little bit with some really challenging um, criteria. And it, it's absolutely fair that it takes multiple parties to script a project. The reason I wanted to make vendors a little bit uncomfortable is I didn't want them to take comfort in, uh, in, in, in the fact that there's other parties involved. I wanted them to, because the thing is that customers don't brag to me about how great their projects are. And so, <laughs> so I, I didn't really reach an overdose level on the customer side just yet. Uh, but, but Josh and I don't really have fundamental differences on this topic. So I guess my promo was slightly link baity, but I think there is some interesting debate to be had around you know what to emphasize and 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 which parties like should be kind of brought to uh the table so we'll, we'll see about that but i don't want to take too much time away from bonnie here because the reason we asked bonnie to join us is because the obvious missing piece in this discussion is is the role of the si and the partner in all of this right and one of the things that 
that really got me going on this uh, was going back to the Rise with SAP initiative. And I'm not, I don't want to really single out SAP too much here, but they provoked me on this topic because there was some talk about one handshake and one contract with Josh, you will recall this talk. And, mm -hmm. and, and the question was, I think everyone kind of got excited because they were like, wow, how did SAP get their SIs to sign on to the, the same contract? Because that implies the same set of KPIs and blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, that wasn't the case. It's actually two separate contracts, as we clarified. Um, but 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 the, the lingering point remained, which was not just for SAP, but for any enterprise project that involves a third party. Are they working at cross purposes like I kind of talked about in my post and you also covered? Or are they really fully aligned with what, with what the goals are here? And so we said, well, why don't we ask someone who really does, lives this in and out every day and find out exactly where this all stands? And so Bonnie's got some stuff to share with us, including, I think, a couple of curveballs that may may make this debate even trickier. So yeah. Bonnie, welcome to the discussion. Thank you. And, you know, I would echo what both of you have said. And so much of what we see in the customer experience during implementation remains the sentiment of a customer for, through the lifetime of the partnership. And the implementation in that first uh, impression that they get is through the deployment partner, through that SI. And good, bad, or ugly, if an implementation goes poorly, it is very difficult to get that relationship back on track. And why it's so critical for that, you know, initial taste of customer, uh, the customer experience to be positive. And that's, in some cases, hard to control when it's, you know, a third party um, you know, really managing the the implementation side. So there's a, um, you know, there's a lot of variability, let's just say, in customer experience, starting with implementation. Right. Uh, just real quick, a couple quick comments. Uh, Brent, on, on you came here for the fight. I will try to draw that out a little more when we get further into the discussion. I just want to go over some of Bonnie's uh, research first. I don't want Josh and I to get into some kind of stupid mano a mano thing when we have some really good content from bonnie to share so that's Except the reason why Brent. i mean yeah why yeah why do we satisfy brent that way yeah um and i don't want to uh get too far into sap here when you say sap was never about one master contract in the comments um yeah of course but if if you go back in time that was a, a promotional part of rise that caused a lot of confusion so that's of course, that wasn't the case, and and there's a lot of good reasons why you wouldn't have one master contract. But, but the discussion around sharing responsibility for a product is another matter entirely, and that's why we're here today. So, so Bonnie, can you just give our, our audience just a little more perspective on how you come by the data that you're gathering, sort of what what you're doing at Raven Intel, and how it is that you're able to kind of speak to this, and and maybe also help us to understand because there's different kinds of SIs and partners. What, what your research focus is so we can kind of know, we're not gonna be able to cover all the variety of SIs and partners in one discussion, so. Yeah, so Raven uh, Intelligence is a peer review site, meaning that uh, customers, once they've completed a project, will write a review about that project, um, about the partner that helped them with that project, as well as um, you know the project itself. And we ask a series of questions, um, about you know their feelings on a project, which are very valid. So were they satisfied? You know what strengths did the partner have? What strengths did the the software vendor have? Um, but we also ask a series of discrete analytical questions. Was the project delivered on time? Was it on budget? Did the team change? Um, you know, and things that we can really draw relationships. Um, you know, across multiple different types of software and different projects to grade a project. Was this successful in the end? You know, what, what about it, um, you know, delivered the value, et cetera. So we measure all of those things directly from the voice of the customer. So the, all of our reviews are written by customers. They're vetted by us to ensure that every single one that's on our site is, is legitimate and verified. Um, so we have over 1,300 projects that we have looked at. And these 1300 projects have been projects completed in the last 24 months across enterprise cloud software. So, you know, of course we mentioned SAP, Workday, Oracle, uh, UKG, Unit 4, 
Um, and we measure very similar things, no matter what the software, to really draw correlations about what can a customer expect during an implementation. The reason I started the company, um, you know, a little over three years ago, was to help customers make a very independent choice in a partner and know who's good based upon what that partner had done in the past. But the interesting thing is, is once we look at the data, you know, as an aggregate set, we can start to see trends. We can start to see trends about an individual SI, um, about types of SI, so the big five versus independence versus, you know, a boutique. And we, we can also make very strong correlations about a software vendor as well. So how do all of their partners perform against their peers? So it's really interesting when we take a bird's eye view, that's the name Raven, um, at the data to say, okay, what's actually happening in the world of implementation? And there's some bright spots, but there's also some big challenges that we've seen this year too. Uh, Thomas has a question for you. Do you follow up after the product has been delivered? The value comes in using the delivered solution. Yep, absolutely. We measure, you know, we ask the customer what what, what stage of the implementation is this? But uh, in most cases, it's after go live uh, once the project has been completed. Uh, so, yes. And and so how would you sort of take the data that you're gathering in the context of this discussion? What, what can we say right now about the role of, of third party services firms in so-called customer success? Where are we with that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say it. It varies really from uh, software to software, from SI to SI. And that's why it's really important if you're going through a digital transformation to do an independent selection of an SI because not all SIs are uh, you know, equal and you shouldn't just accept what your software vendor is you know, recommending to you. you. Really, this is your decision. It's going to make or break the success of your project. So it's important to look at what are other customers saying and getting a very clear and independent viewpoint of what's the previous track record of, a, of an SI. Um, so that's one thing I would say, John, is just a short recap is it's, it's all over the board. What I will tell you is there's a couple of things about projects that, are, that we see very strong correlations with. And that is, so we ask, you know, the big question is, is how satisfied were with you with the partner, with the project, and with the software vendor? So satisfaction, that's an easy one. NPS, everybody knows what that is. And it's a one through 10. Um, and, you know, we the, the average is for all three of them between seven and eight, right? So just in general, if you look at 1,300 reviews, it's between a seven and eight. However, there are really two main factors that if I look at these answers to these questions, I can almost um, predict what that satisfaction is. The first question is, did your team change during the implementation? If the customer said they had a significant project team change or even slight team change during the project, automatically that jeopardizes satisfaction and it's probably going to lead to the project going over time and over budget. So that's one solid correlation. The second is project scoping. So we asked the customer, how precisely was the project scoped? Was it precise? Did you change your requirements and that led to change orders? Did the SI miss certain aspects of the project and so you had change orders that you didn't expect? Or did the SI miss a lot of things and you had multiple change orders? I guarantee if that question is answered that they had multiple change orders that were not anticipated and not, um, you know, not scoped properly by the SI or the software vendor, guaranteed they're going to be a detractor in satisfaction as well, as well as the project going on time and on budget. So certainly we ask those things. So there's some real strong correlations there that we see about a project. And I will tell you in Q3, because we look at our data set quarter to quarter, Q3 had a lot of challenges with project team turnover. And there's some market factors going on in professional services that are leading to this. But it's one thing if you're about to do a project or in the middle of the project, 
you can almost predict in the great resignation world that we're in right now, especially as it relates to PS, that you you are probably going to have a team change and that could jeopardize your project. Yeah, it's tricky, right? Because here I am wanting to nail everyone down for the same KPIs and in my if my fantasy comes true and the SIs do that, but then halfway through the project, the whole team turns over, then, you know, <laughs> so much for my daydreams, like the harsh reality of that is going to screw everything up anyhow. So it seems like the professional services industry is something of a moving target right now. I mean, you were also talking the other day with us about this notion of remote versus on site and how that's right, not yeah. resolved. Can so you talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. And by the way, Josh, feel free to ask questions as well now that we've. I'm going to, I'll get in. Don't worry. Okay. No, no, just feel free. You know, I'm not shy. Yep. Uh, no, oh. I don't worry about that. So, this idea, great resignation um, that's happening, says that 40% of um, the workforce is either looking for a job or has changed jobs this year. And that there's a lot in the pandemic and, you know, the change in the world of work that is, that's behind this. However, what's significant to us in our world of enterprise software is that professional services is the number two industry right now for turnover. It has the highest turnover right behind um, the, the retail and hospitality uh, verticals. And um, so it is double what it was last year. And as a result of, and it's not just consulting. So certainly consulting is a huge. So, so, so Bonnie, just real quick, doesn't that mean that we have, they have to change their taglines from we have the best people to we had the best people, but they quit. <laughs> we'll have someday. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. And maybe, and maybe we'll have them again when they come back. This is really awkward. That's right. That's right. And we're, or we're, we're training the best people because they just got hired. Ouch. <laughs> or you're training the best people for right. us. Yeah. Right. That's, 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 that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and I'm, I, I, you know, of course we, uh, interface with, with consulting teams all, all the time at Raven. And so I, I was talking with a consult, a couple of consultants last week who said that hands down, the reason for this is the lack of travel and, you know, that their lifestyle and their, you know, work style has been to deliver projects on site. And that without this face-to-face -face interaction, without the ability to travel and be one at, with the customer team, that's changing the job entirely. Um, so that's been the, the, you know, just the lack of travel, the lack of in-person relationships is really weighing heavily on professional services, on consulting, and on these on these projects, and whereas certainly they're reducing the cost and T and E, and you know speeding things up to some extent, we've also seen a lot of customers saying, "I don't receive the same sort of um, you know dynamics in a uh, you know in a meeting. We don't get people who voice objections like they had in the past. My stakeholders aren't actively engaged in the project like they need to be because everything is." you know, in this new virtual world. So it's, it's in some ways, you know, it's, I think we were rah-rah for a while on how this is accelerating projects, but it's creating its own set of obstacles as well. So Bonnie, I can understand why the, why there's so much turnover in the retail and hospital hospitality sector. Cause frankly, those industries are brutal right now and the jobs pay terrible and basically they suck. Um, but I don't understand why the professional services industry would be undergoing that level of turnover, doesn't that imply that some of these services firms are doing something wrong in terms of retention? You know, I, I don't uh, know necessarily that it's all um, that that they're leaving. I think there's other opportunities that are becoming available mm. to you. And we see a lot of SI swapping. So consultants going to a different firm, you know, for more money, uh, you know, better, better role, um, you know, that sort of thing. I think the best firms out there are, you know, are paying very close attention to, you know, retention and making sure that their their talent stays. Um, but, you know, those firms that, 
you know, sort of struggled in the past with culture and being able to, to motivate on board and, you know, create potential with their current employee base. Um, they're the ones suffering right now with churn. I want to add two data points that just interesting. Uh, the first is I was actually on a call with a, with a rather large enterprise software vendor just this morning who said, you know, they're, they're finding that one, that professional services is the fastest growth sector for them in terms of selling digital transformation. They, that this, this sector is transforming itself. And, um, and we think, you know, we can say that's a reflection of what's going on. The other thing is that, you know, a lot of, and I don't know if I'd be interested in both of you's take on this, you know, there's a tremendous amount of effort now to automate as much of service delivery and implementation as possible. And that, that pressure to automate and to use artificial intelligence um, is, you know, it's really, I, I'm starting to see some actual results. There's some really great, you know, particularly in this, again, some of the boutique partners I'm, you know, I'm working with directly, have some really great tools to do that. But I'm wondering, you know, if there's also that, you know, the, the nature of the job is changing too. The It's going to become more automated. It's going to, and, and I'm wondering if there's some of that, you know, that skill, you know, the skill retention problem has to do with the fact that the, the, the whole industry is, you know, in this, in its own kind of process of a di dynamic change. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm speculating. I really don't know. I'm just kind of curious because it's interesting. Hey, uh, Carl, nice to see you. Haven't uh, seen you in a bit. You say you have seen zero turnover in your SAP consulting business. If you have a chance, perhaps type into the the chat a little bit about why you think that is because maybe a few of these firms could learn from your example. Yeah. Uh, uh, just real quick, Bonnie, on this topic before we move elsewhere, uh, how, how should customers deal with this? Because that type of turnover isn't healthy for... <laughs> we're talking about the customer success in an SAC context. It's not particularly healthy. So so how, how would you cope with that? Like, would it be something that factors into your vendor evaluation? And if so, could you like kind of get some flavor for this turnover by digging onto your site or elsewhere? Or how would customers deal? Yeah. So I would ask the hard questions during the partner selection. You know, what is your turnover rate? What do you anticipate it to be? You can certainly on any one of our reviews, look at a track record by SI to see how much turnover they've had individually on projects. It's one of the questions that we ask. How much, you know, did your team turn over? Was it a little? Was it a lot? Um, so that's definitely one of those things that you'd want to vet. But asking those questions during the selection, I think, is, is really prudent. Asking, you know, what's your retention strategy? Um, and then finally, contractually, um, if it's possible to write in named resources into your contract to ensure that there's no potential bait and switch that happens, not that that ever happens, um, you know, that, that, that will just, it, it, it's just one more step to ensure that yours isn't going to be the first project that they pull resources off and, and assign to another. I mean, the other reality is in terms of, of churn is not just, you know, professional services folks leaving the organization. It's this um, burgeoning of workload that's, that people have or these firms have. So it's like, you know, people, you have your A players who will start a project and then lo and behold, they'll get another big contract in and we're going to need to move them over here and put our B team on your project. So um, again, the more that contractually you can sort of lock up your resources, uh, the better. Um, and then certainly, you know, plan for, plan for, always have a plan B. If your resources change, what are we going to do? And make sure you have good documentation. So when that they, when they do change, or if it's internally that they've changed, so you're going to have your own, if you're a customer, your team is probably going to change internally too. You know, customers aren't immune to this, you know, this idea is, you know, have the project well documented so that knowledge transfer is easier for the inevitable when it happens. I was just, let me throw away. Go uh, ahead, Josh. You know, yeah, just one other thing because, you know, which, which really kind of cuts to the chase to a certain extent. Um, I, you know, the other way to deal with this as the customer is to work with boutique, smaller vendors who are not going to do the 
you know, that, that bait and switch, because that's not how they operate. And I, you know, in particular, I, I did, a, I, I had, did some work with a, um, a small boutique vendor this, um, this past year and had a chance to talk to their customers. And, um, you know, this is the, this is the dream engagement. I mean, the customers just couldn't stop talking about how wonderful it was to have what they, you know, it they have a partner they could call on and to have just absolutely, you know, rock solid customer support every, you know, every chance they get for, with, with, you know, with deep professional, you know, expertise on board. And that's, that's the, these, you know, that's a, that's a good way, um, good way to prevent it. Um, it's here we go. Carl's I think is reaffirming what I just said. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. He says, um, he says we are Carl says we're a smaller boutique firm around 20 employees, 20, 25 contractors always had a hybrid model, some remote on site. So in their case, there wasn't much of a change. Um, yeah. But and yeah. Then, let me just add the key is these guys can't, you know, the big vendor, the big SIs ride their brand all day long. And, you know, and, and as we all know, project failure doesn't necessarily get their name in the headline at all. It's always a vendor who takes the hit. The SI you know, steps away. And because of their, you know, their C-suite connections, these big, big, big brand SIs continue to get away with this stuff. Um, no small, you know, Carl, I'm sure you guys, how many headlines could you take that say, you know, Carl's company really screwed it up uh, before you'd be out of business. You can't afford to play that game and you don't because it's, it's, it's a real, it's a true career ending move. Um, I want to get to the topic of new, new business models as well, because, you know, especially in the ERP space, not so much in the cloud space, but in the ERP space, business model transitions huge and getting buy on customizations and change orders is what I described is a discredited model in my opinion, but, or, or should be. Um, but, but Bonnie, I, I think it'd be cool if you could click on a vendor on your site and see if they're, they're above the meet the average in terms of change orders per project. Cause I think that'd be a really cool way to evaluate vendors be like, what is your ratio of change orders on a project basis? So just throwing that out there is a, we look at that daily and our customers. So Raven customers get that information. So there are some software vendors out there who are much, much better, particularly with change orders than other vendors. And we certainly have that data and giving that information back in aggregate is part of, of what we're able to do. So um, yes, I think, I think the software vendors who are running toward having that, pro, uh, that, that transparency and independent sort of analysis on how do we look versus others and look at that information as, as things to monitor. Um, well, I mean, we certainly have it, that's, that's for sure. We were actually, Bonnie, you and I were looking at some interesting correlations just the other day. There's some really good ways to slice Raven's data to start driving some of these these decisions around who do you, who do you work who do you work for as a customer and the vendors who do you work on to, you know in your partner ecosystem to do a better job. And, yeah. and what I, what I would say is some of the data will probably surprise you. There are certain vendors who have a little bit, um, uh, you know, more hype than should is due on, on the overall performance of their partner ecosystem. So, um, you know, our data sort of, uh, takes and, and makes, makes it real. LinkedIn user wants to ask what will happen ERP once the cloud's clear. That's not a topic we're going to do today, but I probably will do a future of ER, ERP show at some point. In the meantime, check Diginomica plug, plug time. I did a thing on extracting value from ERP in a customer first world. And Brian Summers has been writing about the future of ERP as well. Short answer, it will never be the same, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, so um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, Bonnie, Josh and I are both biased towards boutique specialized services firms for, I think, similar reasons. Uh, I want to ask you about your data there. Are you? Do you see a higher level of performance uh there or is this just josh and i just being outspoken Frankie. about it yeah. yeah yeah so we see zero correlation with the size of the firm and overall mm -hmm. customer satisfaction um i would you know i would say the inverse is is true and in, in some that's, that's a frustrating data point bonnie dang it <laughs> bonnie? come on man i know i, I stop here 
Um, Truth hurts, John. Damn. Ouch. But actually, I'm really happy to hear that. Seriously. I, and I mean it because I, you know, and maybe I'll have to temper some of my, um, you know, my uh, bio towards those large SIs because uh, they're so big that it is, you know, I, I think I said that in my, in my, in my blog post, just Google, you know, pick your favorite global SI, Google, Google search SI name, project failure. And, project and, watch, failure, the, yes. and watch the results come, pop up. But um Apparently, that's just maybe a data, you know, they just have more projects to fail on. I don't know. Well, and just in general, and, and certainly, you know, we always encourage customers, go out, go out and actually read what customers have to say, because this isn't, these aren't our opinions. These are what the other customers have reviewed about their projects. In general, those projects are generally uh, more over budget, over time, and have more uh, change orders as well. So that that correlates back, as I was mentioning at the top of this, as um, you know, to satisfaction that is lower versus you know the midsize or boutique firms that um, tend to deliver a little bit more on target. That's interesting because I one of my concerns about the largest sizes, I feel like they're less likely to be accountable to a shared set of KPIs and things like that, but. You know, I'm going to respect the the data as well and 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 keep an open mind. I mean, I, I will say that I think some of the larger SIs, Accenture in particular, has been more aggressive about converting to what I would consider more of a digital first type of model. So in some ways, perhaps the scope of that serves them well. Um, Carl says, for those of us who have been doing this for 25 plus years, the ERP customer has a natural progression. They always choose a big, big SI on their initial implementation. The whole you never get fired for high, hiring IBM theory. Uh, anyway, um, and then Carl goes on to say, as time goes by, they realize the value uh, for what they get and move towards smaller firms um, and more independent contractors. Thomas says he disagrees on that one, but Thomas, I'm not sure what you're disagreeing with because you can't really disagree with Carl's experience. So if you're disagreeing with his most recent points, I would object to that because that's his experience, but maybe you're disagreeing with something he said earlier. Um, any, anyhow, um, I, I think that's true, Carl. And the way I'm thinking about it right now, Josh and Bonnie, is that my fantasy of shared KPIs across all the stakeholders in a project is clearly a fantasy at this point, but I do think where where we where we can improve is to encourage customers to be very careful about the firms they select and that that at least can get this conversation heading in the right direction. Um, and, and I think that's where the big versus small SI thing sort of factors in more to the point that Carl's making around, don't just go with your prime vendor that you've always worked with before. And because it's a pain to get a new vendor on the approved vendor list, you know, like, uh, cast your net wide, do your research, and at least now we can start to have that conversation around, uh, you know, KPIs from there, but we have to start with a better selection process. And so maybe this is where some of the research tools you're talking about, Bonnie, can really help. And what we've seen is some of the, the big firms actually subcontract to the independent and boutique. So you might end up hiring a big five, but actually getting resources assigned to you that are they're subcontracting out through smaller niche vendors. So don't assume that it's, you know, because it's the brand name that you know that those are always resources uh, that you're, you know, guaranteed, so to speak, and they never use contractors. That's not the case whatsoever. And I think, you know, making sure that you, um, again, do an independent selection and understand what is the track record of success for previous projects like mine that you're basing your decision on? Not did my SAP rep or Workday rep or Oracle rep walk these guys in the door? That that There's no guarantee of success there. Um, and the partner that you choose is going to be the partner that you need to live with. So make sure that, that it's somebody that that's that's good. Right. Um, and, and Thomas is making the point around seeing lots of companies going for midsize SIs. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that it's important to really debate, um, you know, if customers evolve over time. Um, 
But the one thing I will say is I think too many customers play it safe on this topic and go with safer choices, whether they're big names or just whoever gets grandfathered in before, as opposed to a more vigorous and open selection process. So you start by selecting the right firm. And then I think this is where Josh, this is in your pro Q wheelhouse a little bit, because I think the next step is more regular health checks because when, when you, at least when you read about, the most unsuccessful projects we can talk about success in a sec but when you we talk about customer unsuccess for a moment uh, when you read the failures often what i'm struck by is how how long these projects were underwater before anyone figured out that that you know to take them into the by the time they're down they're in the emergency room triage you know and and it feels like the next step after selecting the right partner and the right software vendor is is to get that regular health check right and to better understand where you're getting off track and to get those course corrections made right and to do it yeah sort of yeah you want you know you, you sometimes do have to repair the engine in flight and 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 try not to crash in the process uh, i think you know and this is this is super critical um you know and more and more the the software vendors are putting in you know these these milestones these reviews but they're still you know, the whole idea with ProQ and, and doing it at, on a weekly basis is that we've all seen this. And in fact, we have data from one of our projects where, you know, in t- within the space of two weeks, the, you know, the project went from chugging along to disaster. And it had to do in that, in one particular notable case, just because they were, you know, they were part of, part of any cloud project almost by definition, it's going to be a data migration. The data migration tool they were using turned out to be faulty. And 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 back to John's blog post, when you dug under the covers, of course, the the, the, the contract, the the, the the field sales guy who sold that contract promised to migrate every byte of data, every byte of historical data from, from the on-premise system to the cloud, which is itself a tricky thing to do and might not be the thing you want to worry about in a big implementation. But the fact is that, that, you know, when you got to that one crucial point, bam, the tool couldn't do it. And one week to the next, this project went went into the toilet. Um, wait around for that milestone three weeks, four weeks down the road. And now you've got back to Bonnie's starting point. You got this one hell of an angry customer. Um, and, you know, you lose that, you lose that initial um, uh, trust, it's damn hard to get it back. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. I think it's, look, this is the problem ultimately with, you know, John, you've heard, and Bonnie, you both heard me say this a lot of time, you know, with transparency comes accountability and that's for everybody. And the customer has to be willing to look in that mirror and go, yeah, I kind of screwed that one up too. Whether I put the B team on one of my points instead of my own A team, uh, whether I didn't, I didn't scope it right. Whether I kept, you know, I let all my LOB folks in the room and they started throwing change orders all around and pretty soon the scoping was completely off, off the wall. There, there's a responsibility there. And, and this is the problem. We, we, we tend to prefer to just sort of, you know, close our eyes and hope for the best. And you can't, you can't, you can't do that. I'll add, you know, and this is, we're not going to debate cloud ERP, but the thing about the cloud is that you do get to fail faster, much faster, and much bigger. And in front of many, many more stakeholders, particularly if you're doing a real transformation. So the impact of failure can be, you know, you got to you got to be in there on a weekly basis because this stuff, these projects are not, are not two-year projects anymore. They can be six month, eight month, ten month, and if you, you know, now you're talking about, you know, a really short window to get this right or else. So yeah, that that you know that's a big deal, definitely. So as we head towards the finish line of our discussion today, I'd like to challenge ourselves in the audience to to share a few things that we think are heading in the right direction on this topic that customers can act on. So Thomas, I will include you in this in the chat. If you would perhaps share a couple of uh, observations on how partners are getting more successful projects across the finish line. Uh, Carl and Thomas are having some back and forth, which is good on project scope and customer size. Uh, And Carl, yes, was just kind of giving his own experience there. So good debate, guys. Keep that going. Uh, But in the meantime, let's kind of talk about uh, 
how we how we're seeing more successful projects come across. I mean, one thing I will say on the optimistic standpoint is that the 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 software to human consulting ratios in SaaS implementations have gone way way down over the classic uh, large scale on premise implementations of old. So. Um, in, in the ERP world, it was not uncommon to have a one to ten, one to fifteen uh, ratio of software expense versus human expense. And when you think about the questionable results of those, some of those implementations, that is just a staggering thing to contemplate. Um, in the SaaS marketplace, at least you're seeing more of closer to one to one. Sometimes it's one to three or one to two, but at least it's in the ballpark. So I do think you're getting towards a. Uh, a better delivery there. But at the same time, that's just cost reduction. That's not, in my mind, true business benefit, which I think is what we're really going for, right? So we don't want to just avoid getting our names in the papers. We want we want to get awards, you know? We want we want awards and, and kudos and handshakes and stuff, but, but not just because we're the biggest partner and the vendor has to give us an award every year. Uh, sorry, oh, I won't. Let's not go there. Whoa, 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 yeah, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah. Hold that, bro. <laughs> yeah, I guess we shouldn't talk about that. But but anyhow, so so folks, let's let's talk a little bit about what what customers can put into practice now to to get better results. Bonnie, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so I just want to follow up on that that point. You can check all of the the boxes that you did right during a project. It was delivered on time, on budget. You know, it um, you know fit everything in the box, but it could still fail to deliver the results that you needed. That impact your business. So, you know, it's really important to keep the, the the business outcome impacts as your guiding North Star. I mean, all of those individual, um, you know, how should I say project milestones and things like that are important, but uh, you don't want to get so into project management that you miss the big picture. So that that's really important. I would say what is some of the things that I see the best SIs and software vendors doing now is really welcoming customer feedback and um, this idea of transparency. So um, I've I've had a, uh, several SIs who have said we want to survey every single one of our customers and ensure that if our projects fail to deliver on this this project that that we we want to go back and make sure that we make it right. And the, the SIs that have a spirit of transparency and put the customer, truly put the customer first, um, you know, and show that visibly and have the proof points behind that. Reviews are a great way to do that, um, I think, are the ones that you want to run toward. And the ones that are, are, you know, afraid of transparency, don't have reviews, don't want to get reviewed, um, you know, publicly and things like that. Those are the ones that that you, you might want to question. Also, the same way with software vendors. And, you know, for instance, SAP success factors, they came to us and said, we want to make sure that independently our customers are happy with our SI, uh, with our SI work. You know, tell us, we, we want to know, we want to get better. You want to run toward the vendors who are not willing to, or don't want to overlook um, you know, some of the, the challenges and fix them versus we have a 99% customer satisfaction rate or wh whatever that that number is, that's so easy to throw up on a, an investor slide. So I think, again, this idea, the spirit of transparency, the idea of very open and candid customer feedback um, in an effort to make things right, those that's, that's the type of vendor you want to do business with because in the long term, they're going to be the best partner. Carl uh, chimed in around, he sees the SaaS model having less customization options, which means less services needed. Carl, I think that's true. Uh, I, I did a post today on uh, my talks with SAP on customer success. And that's one of the points that Scott Russell made in the, in, in our discussions. Uh, and that's one reason why limiting customizations is a priority for a lot of vendors. But I will say that, that there's a big opportunity, not necessarily less services, but different kinds of services. And so uh, in many SaaS contexts, what the what services firms are doing there is they're 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 actually going back and upselling various things when like 
to Bonnie's point, when they're actually delivering for customers, that's a relationship the customer might want to expand. Um, and there's all kinds of ways to do that, whether it's building industry specific IP for the customer, uh, ideally that comes out of the app store instead of a custom build, but whatever it is like, you know, there's a lot you can do to, to help a customer to compete that goes beyond maintenance. And so to me, that's the exciting stuff that the sort of like what we talk about next, which is the more advanced benefits. Uh, but that's a little bit of a different discussion than, than we have time to do today. I'm going to paste, uh, Josh's blog post into the chat to make sure you guys can see that easily. Let me, Josh, let me any throw, comments? Throw in, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, and this is something I, it's in the blog post as well. You know, I think it's really incumbent on the customer to look at the at these projects and and to understand and appreciate this the change management issues that are going to come up and to get get the right people in it, you know, on your end as a customer in the room talking about how is what's this project going to look like? What you know, to Carl's point, there's a lot, you know, there's there there should be more standard best practices built into your software. You should be able to limit the customizations, which are one of the big, you know, the big problems always have been, always will be in terms of initial costs as well as maintenance costs. But I think the customers really have to look at this as, uh, you know, this is a project that you're you're going to have to really think a little differently about than you may have in the past, uh, particularly because, as I said earlier, these projects, because they're about transformative technology, you're going to really transform the company. So, you know, Certain, you know, certain vendors will have in their methodology a fit to standard workshop as, as one of the first things you do when you begin the project. My recommendation, don't wait to the project to do that. Think about that when you're writing the damn RFP. What is it we're really going to do here? And, and where are these impacts going to be in our company? So when you get to the point where you're actually trying to fit that software to your business, you've actually understood much better what the business wants than maybe you would have had in the past was just throw it all, you know, throw it all, all the way over. Um, I'll say to that, to that comment from your slide, you also want to really, you know, think about um, does everything fit into a public cloud? And, and, you know, am I going to try to cram those square pegs into those round holes? And, and again, there's a, there's got to be a really, I think an upfront process that maybe was ignored in the past. Uh, or, or limited in the past in terms of how do you really, as a customer, get ready to uh, to write an RFP and then to actually execute a project? I don't think you just throw it over the wall anymore. No, Mr. Howlett's here. Oh, okay. Not sure he's hearing much. It suggests life is improved for customers. Josh's point, sorry, customer responsibility could be made year on year. Is there real improvement? Was that a question? Uh, he's asking if there's real improvement in this, in this area. Uh, I, I'm not so sure there is Dennis, which is one reason why I wrote my post hammering on this topic around customer success, because I don't personally believe the proof points are there yet. Um, uh, and I guess you could say that is discouraging on some level, uh, <laughs> uh, that the hype has gotten so far away from the reality. Um, I did a separate piece on cloud ERP where I tried to outline a maturity model for the benefits that I think are possible. And one of my points is that most of those benefits are far beyond go live. And I don't talk to too many customers that, that achieve a number of them. And, and so I'm kind of saying to the vendors and customers, like, let's move forward. I mean, I think the, the, the thing that people got excited about the last couple of years is that cloud software helped a lot of companies cope with very difficult circumstances and transition into remote working models when their businesses depended on it. And so everyone got a lot of pats on the back uh, for that. But but I don't think going forward that constitutes, you know, success in, in the world we're moving into. That that was just a way of adapting for survival. And look, everyone rallied and deserves a lot of credit for that. Uh, but I don't think that's going to be enough going forward. Um, Dennis says, thank goodness his cooking is improving. Uh, yeah, um, I, I could use one of your meals right about now, come to think of it, but. As long as he's not cooking the books, that's, yeah. <laughs> that. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I, I guess I would say if I want to like take a more optimistic spin on, on, on Dan's question is that I think that that these types of conversations are happening more often. I think the things that I like are, 
I think uh, vendors and SIs are a little more accountable these days due to the amount of public reviews that that happen. Things are a little more transparent. I mean, Bonnie at Raven Intel is one example of that trend, I think. Um, and from a customer's perspective, I think more customers are more informed. Uh, and and actually, uh, next week's guest, we're going to have a nice debate about that next week. Guess what? I have a guest next week that I actually had to get proof through PR channels. Can you believe that? Unlike these two who could just sign on the dotted line and show up. I got Hank Barnes from Gardner coming on and we're going to debate Whoa. this. Con we're going to debate this concept of the informed buyer and just how informed buyers actually are. Uh, Cause I think Hank is a little skeptical sometimes about the modern buyer and how informed they actually really are. But the point being like uh, there is access to more information more easily. Um, you're not living out of the Gartner, uh, playbook as like the stone tablets anymore. And I think that that does help customers to be more savvy about their choices, but eh, there's still a lot of trouble projects out there. So I can't really, can't really say otherwise. Sorry. And that's the point. I mean, we, 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 we there was this assumption that we move to the cloud and a lot of problems will magically melt away. And, you know, I've seen in my, you know, obviously more anecdotal analysis, um, no, we're still seeing a very, very large number of projects that, again, fail to deliver expected value um, in addition to, you know, on time, on budget. So I, I think, you know, I don't think the problem's been solved. I think that, you know, what I'm hoping this kind of conversation does is pressure these vendors who have all these customer success executives or board areas that have customer success after to, to really step up and and and, you know, Stop, stop, stop. Just sort of pat yourselves on the back and actually walk the walk and talk the talk. I think that would be pretty exciting. It's the buzzword boomerang effect, Josh. If you start using buzzwords, people like us are going to start uh, holding up that mirror. Um, though, as you rightly pointed out, uh, there there's also a discussion to be had about the role of analysts and customer success as well. Yeah, and next one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but. And having been to a number of analyst events uh, lately, I, I I guess I have to question whether we're doing a very good job either. Um, so, <laughs> sorry to add more kindling we, to the fire. Yeah, we could really there. piss a lot of people off. Um, but yeah, a lot, S, a lot of S, a lot of a lot of esoterica out there. To be honest with you, in the in the analyst kingdom, and and in my opinion, not enough jugular conversations like this one. Oh, I will also add, you know, at the risk of really getting it in there. Um, okay. Go ahead, Josh. Okay. You know, that, that, um, I don't know, I got distracted by Jochen's question. <laughs> oh, do you want to go there? Can you remember what you're going to say? We'll go to, we'll go to Dr. Wolf's question. Hello, Jochen. How likely do you think it is, John, that large vendors will deliver on your six points laid out in the post? Well, look, I mean, I, I, I deliberately made that a hard post. I don't think there's a single vendor out there that can check all those boxes yet. Um, but I did include some examples on just about each one of, of vendors who are doing some of those things that I, that I called called upon there and even the one that might be the most sensitive around providing auditing and licensing dashboards um there are vendors that are talking about that uh i had a frank talk with a couple of them as well um now <laughs> some vendors are so modern in their licensing they don't actually have to provide that <laughs> uh because there is no auditing that, the, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and and josh you brought up earlier and we should probably raise this point that uh, we weren't really talking about vendors today, but you know, audits and license reviews are antithetical to customer success. So the it's the height of hypocrisy to to have a customer success program and and not provide your customers with ways of understanding when they're transgressing their licenses with all the data and all the dashboarding that you're capable of today. <laughs> I would refer people to the Upper Edge blog uh, for a blow by blow. They have been posting lately on all kinds of various forms of licensing negotiations and overstepping on audits and stuff like that. So that kind of behavior still goes on and kind of undermines this entire conversation. That's, that's, and unfortunately, you know, it, 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 I'll just add, i um, not seeing much blood on the floor. Darn. Den, Den um, wanted like a big scrimmage. Uh, Den, I'll try to get into that before the show ended. I, I just, uh, we had other stuff going on, but I'll, I'll see what we can do. Blood yeah, the well, well, there's not much. Um, there's not. Yeah, then that's the problem is that we don't. Josh and I don't disagree that much, so it's kind of hard to have bloodletting here. But anyhow, 
Go ahead, Josh. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> um, I, you know, um, I'm keeping. I keep losing my train of thought because you all just keep throwing all these things at me. Um, I, you know, but I, I think maybe because we are getting sort of at the top of the hour here. I think you know, there's the thing that I'm, I'm hopeful for is that you know this boomerang effect will start to actually have an impact, and you know, because at the end of the day, um. You know we're we're going to have to we're going to have to do something about where you know help on the vendor side. Vendors are going to have to start defining competitive advantage in the cloud in any way they possibly can. And we, the problem with fit to standard is that fit to standard is you know makes everyone look like a commodity. If all you're doing is delivering commodity business practices in the cloud, then what is what is your value add as the vendor? Um, so you know, there's there's going to be a, a there's going to be a point in which you're going to you're going to differentiate. Uh, I think the same for the SIs actually. And there's you know this is Carl and 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 a couple of other folks were commenting. I mean, there's there's a real pressure on these SIs to you know internal pressure to find the next the next revenue source. Where are we going to go when all the low hanging fruit has been stripped away by the cloud? And that really has has happened. Um, um, competing on failure is really a bad idea. I would suggest competing on success uh, be a much, much better one. And um, I think, you know, and, and what I was going to say is that we, you know, when we, we see in the contracting world, this is a big, this is a big problem, um, you know, with, with how do you do contracting uh, as a small, smaller company, a smaller, you know, working with, with a, with a global SI and a global software vendor who have massive legal teams. Uh, this is really a big problem in, in state local government where these, you know, they 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 have people who do contracts with vendors who are paving roads and then they have one they, the same guy does a contract with the vendor who's delivering IT services. They're not specialists. So the ability from the vendor standpoint to improve contracting is is really, you know, it's going to be a big one, I think, because it, it, Barney and I were, you know, with this thing we've been doing working on lately, it's 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 really easy just to cherry pick customer failures in the public sector because public disclosure, freedom of information uh, act and other things really force that stuff out into the open. And, and that's it turns out to be a point of real vulnerability for the vendors who aren't you know, aren't paying attention to this problem and and their SI partners. Um, so, you know, I think I think if I were if I were a vendor trying to keep my name out of the headline, I would be looking at this contracting thing and how do I make sure that I'm not in there bamboozling mm. literally a customer a customer, particularly a public sector one, who will then turn around and just, you know, and boy, you you start going to some of these deals that have gone wrong and now you've got a unionized workforce that's that's starting to line up against you the vendor <laughs> you know is that what you really want uh, you know yeah, that's no not you a, don't not not, not, not a good the, idea not yeah. one for the customer success playbook bonnie i'll get yeah. back to you in a sec but i want to do one more thing with josh uh since since i hyped a little bit our you and i settling our differences which was probably a little bit unfair promotion um do, do we disagree on any of this do you think i don't think so i think i think you know i i think we disagree no, I think we violently agree. I mean, mm. um, you know, I, everything I read in your blog post was just sort of like the yin to the yang. I was mm. sort of working on myself. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I guess, I guess, I, I tend to think that the only way this is going to change is if customers really force mm. it. I think the vendors will continue. I mean, again, we we see these we see all these titles with customer success. I used to um, I used to you know piss everybody off who had that title. I you know I'd sit them down and say, "Thank you, you you you're now the new VP of blah blah customer success." What happens to you personally when the project mm -hmm. fails? What do they cut off a body part? Do they you know kill off your bonus? I mean, right. do you actually have skin in the game as the executive with customer success in your title? And they, you know, they would usually run for the exits and I would never get to talk to them again. Um, Got it. Hey, while we wrap up, if anyone has a final comment, we're going to be, uh, oh, Brent's disappointed. Brent, Brent, I'll try to come through for you in a sec here. Uh, sorry about the popcorn. I didn't mean to Oh, no, I'm, gonna get, I'm taking a hit from um, John. Okay, no, I'm not going to take a hit really, uh, but I do want to get into one thing. But, uh, but um, yes. Brent, I do apologize, Brent. I tried to make it as exciting as possible, but I can't create a faux feud. Um, but uh, but there is one thing I do want to comment on. Um, 
Oh, Carl, sorry you didn't see the links to the posts. Uh, I'm not going to repost them. I already posted them. They might LinkedIn might have a block on those. Um, so what I would suggest is just go on to Diginomica and type in like read customer success, and then you can find both of them. Sorry, the links didn't come through. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess the put in final comments now. I I didn't really have any issues with with Josh's post really, and in fact. Like, I think there's something fundamentally correct about the notion that until customers assume ownership over their own projects, then nothing will really change. Uh, I, the one thing I will say, however, is that I think I was disheartened by certain vendors or individuals that I felt took comfort in your post uh, with the focus away from them and onto the customer. So that that bothered me a little bit, I, I'll say. Um, and 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 not not I thought your post was awesome. I mean it. It was brilliantly written too, but it just frustrated me a little bit from a vendor standpoint because I wanted to them to like sit on my post for a little bit. Now, to your credit, you pointed back to my post so many times that, like, if a vendor wasn't going to go back to my post, it's like their fault because they're not listening to you. But I, I really wanted them to kind of hold their feet to the fire. And it, it is interesting how when they read about the customer responsibility, they start to get really excited um, about yeah, yeah. The, let's let's talk yeah. more about what the customers need to do here, and it's like. That that part is a little bit tricky, I think, to manage as far as how do you keep vendors on their toes, but also acknowledge the customer role, and that's the problem with these different audiences. Well, well then honestly, I mean, if my blog post succeeds, then these vendors are going to have to go through Bonnie to get to the customer. So we'll all win because, yeah, if, you know, if the customer says, "Give me the data," and and by the way, I don't, I'm not interested in your own data, vendors or SIs. Screw that. Let's be really blunt self-reported self-assessments no thank you um you need independent you need some of the, the independent third party verified um, so yeah i i think i think you know this is a this is sort of a nice uh, kind of you know virtuous loop um uh Absolutely. brand thanks uh thanks brent and brent i tried to do you a solid there that was as close as i could come to a true like a true disagreement but since I did imply that, and probably I link baited you a little bit, so sorry about that. But I, at least hopefully we delivered on a good, good discussion. I got really pissed off about a link bait this week on Twitter. If you guys noticed, because uh, this this idiot uh, wrote an article saying that he revealed the true ending of The Sopranos during an interview with uh, oh crap, what's his name now? Sopranos director, forgetting his name. Uh, but anyhow, uh, went through the interview and no. Um, no, no definitive answer on the ending. And look, who cares about how the Sopranos ended at this point? But it was such a link bait. And I don't want to indulge in that. But anyhow, I'm glad you came, Brent. And uh, always good to see you. By the way, folks, you should always catch Brent's shows. Brent does fab job on enterprise discussions on LinkedIn. So, um, in I fact, definitely. his his uh, his show on privacy that he's been doing with the Zoho peeps has been fabulous. That's most Fridays, as far as I can tell. And then his Amazon show is really good too. Amazon which is Watch Amazon, is real fun. Yeah. Which comes on in the Friday afternoons right before mine. Uh, David Chase, thank you. Appreciate that. Right. Uh, yep. Bonnie, take us home. What are your final thoughts? Um, implementation uh, and that initial impression that you have with a software vendor is so critical to get right. And um, for the lifetime of your partnership, it's going to set this set you up for success or failure. Um, so make sure that number one, you're choosing the right software vendor, but number two, that you're choosing the right partner uh, to lead you on that path. And, um, you know, you want to go run toward both the software vendors and the SIs that are open to transparency and ones that are not afraid to show you what their customers have said about former projects and, and really have the proof points to show, um, you know, what they are claiming during the sales process is, is what you're going to get during implementation. Um, so, uh, yeah, get, get the implementation right. And, uh, and you're, you're well on your way to a good transformation. I think that's a good place to leave it. Thanks all. Thanks audience for keeping us on our toes. You did an excellent job today of keeping us on the hot seat where we belong. Uh, next week again, I got Gardner's Hank Barnes on the show, which is very cool, especially since yesterday I just poked a bunch of fun at Gartner on a video with Vinnie Merchandani about to be released. That's pretty awkward. Uh, 
so yeah, I was poking fun at some of the tech hype, which uh, I think... Bonnie and I are available next week when Hank uh, pulls yeah. the plug. So yeah, you just let us know. We'll be back. Yeah, yeah, I- exactly. Um, yeah, I'm not going to discuss. I'm not going to discuss the Sopranos um, ending. I I didn't think it was brilliant, but I I don't think it was terrible either. Um, but I, I think it's pointless to talk about whether Tony died or not. If you if that's what you care about, you missed the point. But anyhow. Let's let's okay. move on from that. Say goodbye. Catch you guys next week. Thank you. Great Thanks to see you all. Thanks.